you are in the right place because today, can everyone see my screen? Can you see my screen? Okay, we're going to go through it this way just because sometimes it doesn't advance as well. But we're talking about sibling rivalry, competition, and the stubborn child. So I really want to focus on some of the simple ways to take the rivalry out of siblings and also for you to, to really prevent perhaps some of that rivalry from even starting. So that's another point I definitely want to cover. So if you ever feel like an exhausted mom referee or wonder why your kids fight a lot, you're not alone. You're in the perfect place. And so some of the things I want to talk about is how much do you want to referee? How much do you want to get involved? So today I want you to learn three important things. So this might come as a surprise to you, but you may need to be more concerned, worried about what you consider your good child, the easy child, more than your not so easy child. And you probably know who I'm talking about. And I'm really serious about this. And so we're going to cover that part. There's also another crazy fact I want you to know that sibling rivalry is one of the most powerful ways for kids to get their basic needs met. This is why it can be so hard to change. So later, I'm going to share with you how you can get your kids' needs met without them resorting to fighting. But I think that this I can't actually be said enough because a lot of times moms will come to me and they're like, oh my gosh, Kelly, they're driving me crazy. You know, this is such a problem. Yes, I hear that it's a problem for you, but often it's actually not a problem for your kiddo. It's actually a solution to a problem they have. And until we actually step in their booties and really get a lay of the land and go, right, oh, this is why they're doing this. Often we can't really help them. So if you stay to the end, I really want to end with how some tips and tools from my Peaceful Parenting Path toolbox that can help you keep your cool during your kid's next angry child fight. So that's my goal. I hope that sounds like, yes, you're in the right place because I really listen to, you know, one of the great things about having this um, Facebook group and Casey, you are one of the first members of the Stubborn Child Solutions Facebook group. One of the great things is I'm hearing from you. And so these are many of the sibling rivalry things that I'm hearing of parents saying like, I don't get it. Like, why are they fighting? Or I have one kid where we tell them, hey, don't let it get to you. Don't get riled up. And they're still getting riled up and they're screaming bloody murder and it's driving us all crazy. So if we haven't yet met, hello, I'm Kelly. And my my real passion is being a strong little child turnaround specialist. So I've had the great pleasure for the last 26 years. I have spent the bulk of it helping moms get their stubborn child to listen, but without yelling, nagging, or caving in so everyone can enjoy a peaceful and fun home. Um, I wrote a book called When You're About to Go Off the Deep End, Don't Take Your Kids With You. And with that, I spoke to over 1 million parents through radio, television, and magazines. That was about 15 years ago now. Um, and I'm working on my second book, which I'm really excited about. And really who I really am is I am a recovering people pleaser through and through. I have two teens and a dog named Coconut, and I live on a hippy dippy island with a population of 10,000. Um, so yeah, it's a little bit about me. So a few sibling rivalry um, things to keep in mind. It's important to solve these issues because of three main things. One, it can create a super stressful household. So if there's a lot of screaming, yelling, and if you happen to also be a sensitive, highly sensitive person, a lot of times that high-pitched screaming or fighting or worrying about the kids can just create a lot of undue tension. Um, the second thing is it can actually damage self-esteem. And this is a really important piece. I really want all of your kiddos to be developing and you helping them to fortify and nurture their healthy self-esteem. The third one is it can trigger you to lose it and then feel a lot of mom guilt. That's really not productive. It's not you being your very best. So the first, there's three main sibling rivalry lessons I want you to get today. And the first is this, to really get a sense of why do they fight? So if you think of it like an iceberg, you know, the sibling fighting is like the top of that iceberg that we see when we're on the boat. And when we're looking at it, we're like, yeah, it doesn't look so big. Okay, they're fighting. We just need to solve it. We need to either 
put them in separate rooms, separate them for a while, or we need to discipline them, or we need to tell one of them like, hey, lay off. This is too much. But I want you to remember my crazy sibling fact, which is this. Sibling rivalry is one of the most powerful ways for your kids to get their basic needs met. So <laughs> the question might be, what are these needs? So there are two basic human psychological needs that we all need to be met, and including you. So the first is belonging. So how do we belong? You know, just being born into a family, we feel like we belong to that family. But things can slowly happen. Um, if you have a sensitive child, and secret, <laughs> Many stubborn kids are sensitive kiddos in disguise. So if you have that child, there are times where they can take things sensitively. They can be extra sensitive to how you approach discipline, um, how you share constructive, what you might think to be constructive criticism. And I like to think of like an armadillo or a turtle because some sensitive kids can start to armor themselves to shell, put a shell around themselves. And a good takeaway from this is um, a good example of when they do this is when it's like, I don't care, do what you want. You can discipline, you can say no all you want. I don't care. Talk to the hand. Take away as much of my screen time as possible. I don't care. And I realized that I had been severing my relationship with them and I wasn't aware of it. And this can be a huge moment of, oh my gosh, what am I doing? So if you've ever worried about your relationship with your child or where that relationship is going, this is especially for you. Do you feel connected to them? This is where I often with clients recommend doing some triage, um, building up the relationship of having just a special date with them, even if it's just an hour in a weekend to do something special with them where you're just having fun. I think as moms, we can take our role so seriously, we forget to put the F factor in, which is not the F word, but the fun factor. Are we also having fun with them? Are we connecting with them? I've got a client right now that I'm helping and this family has gotten great strides. And one of the reasons I believe they've gotten really great, um, they're seeing their own stubborn child, actually strong-willed child turnaround, is because we really identify that um, one, their, their son, his love language is physical touch. And so often they were including the preschool was using words, words of affirmation saying, great way to go. Oh, I love that picture you're doing instead of just putting a hand on their shoulder. That's it. But that was the way he felt connected. So that's on belonging. The second one I talked about is significance. How do you feel significant? How do you feel special? And the reason I'm spending so much time on this is because siblings are trying to get both. And in the significance area, if they feel that one sibling is special doing this. So there could be one sibling who's really great at cleaning up, who's really great at being helpful. Well, they're like, hmm, that sibling has got that down. I'm not going to touch that because they're the best at that. So I might be the best at the worst at that to be significant. Or I might go for something completely different. I might be the outgoing one. I might be the one who in a group is like, ta-da, here I am. Let me show you my latest dance. Or I might be the really sporty one while the other one might be the academic one. So typically there is something to birth order. It's not always the case, but there's definitely a bell curve and an average that generally older kids, only kids tend to be more independent, more responsible, more um looking for having higher standards, more worried about perfectionism, more taking care of everybody else. That's usually the birth order. And now I know um, some of you have twins. It's funny, I've had three moms in the last 24 hours talk about their twins. It's even more important when it comes to twins. Oftentimes, they actually know who's the older one, interesting enough, even if it's only by five minutes. 
They're like, yeah, I came out first, just for the record, just so you know your place. Any questions so far or thoughts, or is this landing of what I've been saying so far? Okay, I see a head nod. You're going to have to unmute yourself if you want to say something, though. Didn't have anything to say. I was just, it's landing. Okay, great. Awesome. And so no, I mean, we put so much emphasis on our spouse and our love language. I just never really took time to appreciate that same thing in a child. Yeah, great. Great. And we're going to go a little bit deeper. So if you have other questions, I want to hear them because it it is so different. You know, I, I have what I call the peaceful parenting path, which is nine steps. And what I'm talking about a lot today is the sixth step, which is self-esteem motivators. And this, I'm not going to go into in deep, but it's something to keep in mind. Yeah. Here's where it, it lands, I think, is the stubborn child and what we call the good child, and you know who they are. Even if you don't say it out loud to them, you know your easier child. Almost every parent, when we're really honest, and we actually might feel some guilt about it. The thing I, I love helping clients realize is often our more challenging child, the one that... <laughs> yeah, just beats to their own drum, has to carve out their own experience, has to ask more questions. They are generally the child that makes us a better parent and inspires us when we are willing to be a better human being. That is their gift. And all of our kids have their gifts, but that is where I feel the stubborn child comes from. But here's the important part is that they're going to get their needs met, but in a very different way. The important part as a loving parent, I believe, especially when we were faced with challenges, is how are they getting those needs met? Because if they're getting them met in a negative way, it's important for us to figure out how can we perhaps inspire them, motivate them to get their needs met in a more helpful way, in a way that builds what I call team family, which is actually the fifth step, where we're coming from a, hey, we're all in this together. It's not you against me, her against you, him against whatever. It, it's we are coming at this so that as a family, we can inspire and support one another to be our very best. I think this quote might might help tie it together. Your child's self-esteem doesn't come from believing they are the best, but from believing they can show up as their best their most authentic and often, often messy self. And so when I look at self-esteem, I when I'm going deep with a client, I'm looking at, okay, how is their child getting their needs met, their belonging needs and their significant needs? And if they're getting them met from being better or worse than somebody else, because they can do both, you can actually feel significance from being the worst at something in your family. You absolutely can stand out that way. Because by standing out that way, often you'll get attention for it. And negative attention is always better than no attention at all. You might be the best at controlling your parents and keeping their attention than any other child in the family. And that in and of itself is hugely significant, makes you feel special. Often when we're triggered by our child's behavior, by the, our kids fighting, it can often be one of three things, actually. Let me talk about the first two, though. One of them is that it reminds us of ourselves, something we might not like in ourselves that wasn't really allowed to show up. So it can be a way that we're actually... Um, safeguarding our own self-esteem. The second thing is it can remind us of someone we really don't like or a behavior we don't like in somebody. So I don't like that in you fill in the blank. It could be yourself. It could be your spouse. It could be a grandparent. You're like, oh my gosh, they are turn. They're going to turn out exactly like so-and-so. And when that happens, it can build up our mama worries and fears of our anxiety. And even if we don't say it, I believe, especially our stubborn kids, our strong-willed kids, our sensitive kiddos, they feel it on a level 
and they'll start to fight us on it. So it's kind of like an invisible tug of war. They will grab and they're like, oh yeah, watch me. <laughs> I'm going to do it even more because there is something powerful here. Sibling rivalry lesson two. And so we talked a little bit about these good child concerns and I want you to really be aware of it. So how can a good child be problematic? You know, an easy child, I agree, can be so dreamy. They're accommodating, they're flexible, they're helpful, but they can also be an anxious people pleaser in the making. How do I know this? I am a recovering people pleaser. And so when we are so focused on accommodating others, being validated by others, making sure we are always the good one, making sure we're always the helpful one, making sure we're always there for others, it can actually feed esteem, but it's actually not genuine, healthy self-esteem. I also want to talk about these good child concerns around competition, because this can be, again, under the iceberg, where many kiddos can fiercely hold on to their birth order. So they will be like, I am the good one. I am the smart one. So if, if they get their self-esteem from, I am the academic, I am the straight A student, what can happen is that when they get that B plus or that just less than perfect, it can be devastating to them. Devastating. Um, I had a, an amazing experience when I did my pre-doctoral internship. I got to be um, do it at a university. And what was so great about it is because my sweet spot is kids, but then I got to see these young adults and around exam time, I would have students fall apart. <laughs> and the ones who were falling apart were the ones that had their self-esteem that was so based upon, but in my family, I am known as the, the, the good student. I am the best student. And so if they were so worried, they're like, I think I'm going to fail this course or even if not fail this course, I'm just not going to be at the standards I have for myself. They were a mess. They weren't sleeping. They were having um, huge anxiety attacks. Um, so this is a really huge piece of the puzzle with sibling rivalry. To watch, how are they getting those needs met? How are they getting their self-esteem? How are they seeing themselves in the world? Because if they're not able to fully accept and express their truest self, but that's also the self that makes mistakes sometimes. That's also the self that isn't always the best student. My, my partner, I so appreciate him. One of the things he does that I love sharing that I've adopted myself in my own life is when someone gives him a compliment, like, hey, you are have helped our company. That's what he does. He helps companies and in, in leadership roles. He's like, oh my gosh, you're amazing in your leadership role and you've helped ours. And he'll say, yeah, I often am that way. But he want, so you can say, thank you. I often am. If someone says to me now, Kelly, you are so kind. You have such a big heart. Very true. Most of the time, I'm not always that way. And it's actually good that I'm not always that way. This was an aha from one of my clients, Maisie, and we had gone through this in a bigger way. She was part of my boot camp, but one thing she said was, one thing I'm now focused on from yesterday's class is the sense of belonging my daughter needs, particularly since my son has come along. I sense that Caroline is trying to be the good girl that I ask her to be. I think she's found that if she is good, she is maintaining her place. Now I'm realizing why she's often devastated when I scold or discipline her. She just falls apart. She is rarely bad and often tells me, mom, it's okay, right? When she does something wrong, it's all making sense now. She doesn't want to be bad because that is not supportive of her place in the family as the good girl. I had a talk with her this morning about mommy's love. Mommy will love you regardless of her actions. I think she needs to hear that a lot. Thank you, Kelly. So I just want to share that one because it really hit home for her. And I hope that that brings it a little bit to life to you as well. So quick sibling parenting tip. It's helpful to say these kinds of things to kids who need constant validation. I love you because you're uniquely you or just because you're you. That's why I love you. How many mistakes did you make today? How could they be useful? Huh? What did you learn from that mistake? Things like that, getting to them to think in a different way. Is it possible to be liked by everyone? I agree. Not everyone's going to like us. 
Who doesn't like you? Why may they not be the best friend for you? The last lesson I want to get, get give to you today is how do we take rivalry out of siblings? So three things I want you to think about and consider. Stop jumping into the sibling fight ring. So example, when I used to drive the boys in the car to different play dates after school and to their music lessons after school, it was like a boxing match in the back. And one would start poking, the other would, would start hitting, and then, and it was exhausting. So one of the things I did was I, and I would get involved and I'd be like, hey, who started it? Come on, hands to self. And I would be reminding and I would try to then separate them and we'd put things in between them. It was exhausting. So the thing that really shifted things for me is to not jump in. So I just told them one day, I'm like, hey, I realize there's a pattern here that when we go to music class, you guys are often fighting in the back. I just want you to know it's not safe for me. It's not enjoyable for me from now on. If you decide to fight, I'm just going to pull over and wait. I'm going to have a magazine there. I will start driving again when you show me you're quiet and ready. That's how I'll know you're ready to go. And so whenever you make a big change like this, you want to make sure that you are seeding the idea first, making sure you've told them what you're going to do and then follow through. So I brought my magazine and lo and behold, they're going to test me. And they did. And they're fighting and yelling. And I just pulled over quietly and I sat and they fought for a few minutes. And then one of them was like, oh, we're not moving anymore. And they're like, okay, we're ready to go. We're ready to go. And then like, no, we're not. And one started fighting. And I was just kept reading, going through my magazine, didn't say a word. And then when they were quiet, I, they started to giggle and I started to drive. Huge difference than me saying, hey, come on, you guys. How many times have I told you this? Really? The second thing is to stop taking sides or pretending you know what happened. This is really important. And this really landed for me. I remember years ago, the boys were fighting in the living room and I was washing dishes. And it was often the uh, younger one who said it was the older one. And I kind of thought that that was true. And as I was washing dishes, there is a mirror. And I hear the younger one say, stop hitting me. Graham, stop hitting me. And I can see in the mirror into the living room. And as I look in, they're completely at opposite sides of the room. And the younger one is yelling, stop hitting me. And the older one is doing nothing. So that was my little reminder. Third one, stop thinking you need to immediately deal with a situation and you have to have all the anchor, uh, answers. One of my clients right now, um, <laughs> the dad has gotten involved in our sessions, which has been great. And Marcus's turnarounds with his three kiddos over fighting over the remote. And what's been really great is he took it away. He put it up and he looked at him and he said, that's a tricky one. Let's discuss it at dinner. I'm not sure how we're going to deal with it. And that was it. So the sibling parenting win. Oh, this is one of my um, clients. She said, wow, it works like magic. Since putting your sibling fight strategy into practice, the boys haven't been fighting nearly as much because as the eldest puts it, it's just no fun anymore. No one gets in trouble. <laughs> I thought that was really cute. So that's the end of my formal part. I'm going to give you, I still want to go through at the end, if you are interested in how to ha handle angry child fights, I'm going to give you some, I think I've got four of my tools I'm going to just quickly cover. But I also just want to share with you that where, what I've been talking about today is really on the sixth step, which is self-esteem motivators. It's one of my favorite things to talk about because I believe it can be a game changer for your kids life. Um, there's three steps in there. We really cover deeply the second step, but I just really encourage you to really start looking at your kid's self-esteem and your own self-esteem by using some of these tools, asking yourself, how is my kid feeling significant, feeling that they have control in their life? How is my kid feeling like they're belonging? One of the ways is attention seeking that they look for, because this can really hugely change how they think about themselves, um, where they'll risk, where they won't risk. Yeah. One of the things I'm going to just offer right now is that 
coming, I think it's April 13th. I'm starting a new strong will child solutions um, boot camp for moms. And I'm really excited about it. So if you're sitting here and you're like, I love this material and I really want to go deeper, please reach out to me. Um, because I always do a one-on-one -on -one beforehand to see if there's a fit to get into that boot camp. It's a nine-week course where I go over each of these in depth. Um, but I also, you kind of have me on speed dial so that when something comes up in the week, you can say, Kelly, but how do how does that relate to me? How can I use that? Or I tried that and this part's working, but this isn't. So if that's at all of interest, please reach out to me. Um, there's also an early bird special to sign up ahead of time. So this is how to keep your cool during the next angry child fight you encounter. So I, I just pulled out four of the 48 uh, peaceful parenting path tools that I have. So the first one is about buying time. So this is, you know, take a page from Marcus that I spoke about earlier and check your own significance needs. So what do I mean by this? I mean, if you feel that you need to have the answer right away or your children are fighting and you need to deal with it right then and there, if there is no blood, if somebody is really not getting hurt, often I just share what I witness just as a witness. So I can see you guys are really fighting right now. And I stop and they're well, yeah, so-and-so is doing that. And so-and-so is doing that and they started it, huh? And then I go to the second one. Tell me more about that. So instead about jumping in, I'm really looking at the fourth one is asking more than I tell. Tell me more about that. How did that make you feel? Why do you think you guys are fighting? What do you think is helpful about fighting? That's one of my best questions. What do you think is working about this? I know you guys are feeling angry right now or frustrated right now, but how is this working for you? And just have the conversation and think about it. Now, tensions might be so high that you won't be able to have a conversation. They might not be, they might be so wound up that you actually can't get any good information out. So then you go back to buying time. Let's talk about this tomorrow when we're all cooled down. With younger kids, sometimes then I bring out the puppets. I'm like, hey, let's act it out. Okay, but this time I want you to be your sister. Huh, so what do you think your sister was thinking in that? Hmm, that's interesting. So just coming at it from a different standpoint. So here's the thing. I'm going to talk about the parent timeout. Especially for stubborn kids, strong-willed kids, most timeouts backfire with them big time. The only real timeout that works is a parent timeout, which is where you take the timeout and you say, hey, I'm getting really frustrated right now. I need to take a little timeout so I can cool down so I can come back and deal with this in a more calm, better way. So we talk a lot about self-regulation with our kids. I don't feel we talk nearly enough about the self-regulation we need for our own self. The cool thing about taking a parent time out is that then you're actually modeling for your kid how to do a timeout. Why we do a timeout. We should do a timeout not to feel bad, not as a discipline tactic to feel bad, because when we feel bad, we just tend to do worse. When we feel better, when we feel calmer, we tend to have access to better solutions, to more regulated. And so I've had this so with so many parents, so humbling. It's those times when we're like, stop yelling, right? And we realize we're yelling, you know, yeah. what's your next step? You know, I've given you a couple of things to consider here. One might be, how does my child, how do my children get their self-esteem met? Are they coming at it from trying to be better than their siblings, than their friends? Are they trying to be louder than them? Are they trying to have more control than them? You know, just knowing, just having more awareness, because until we're aware of what's going on, we can't change it. We cannot change it. Now, for some of you, you might really be type A and great, great at um, taking information and running with it. Others of you might be trying to duct tape your family together. So you're using all these different tips and tools 
And you're like, okay, let's band-aid duct tape this together. So the other thing I'm really encouraging you to do is if you feel you could use support, if you feel like there's lots of storms that brew in your family that you really want to tackle, maybe this is the year you're ready to really make some changes. I just want you to know I'm here for me, for you. And if it's a fit, I will do my darndest in terms of helping to support and give more tools to bring this all together. Because those are the two paths. So you can keep doing what you've done. You can try to duct tape, it, duct tape it together, or you might feel confident. You're like, I just need some parenting tweaks and this is what I would need. And then I would say, yay you, I'm cheering you on. So this is the time to get your parenting questions answered. <laughs> Why do my kids fight? And the great thing is I have Casey on. So I'm going to take your question first. Okay. And I uh, thought of one more. From your oh, question. okay. Great. Okay. I'm going to close. Yeah, I'm sure that this is probably the most common question that you get, or you hear this all the time. Great. Love but it. But you talk about how kids act out because they're not getting their needs met. Yes. How do you respond? Because I don't like when people say, well, they're doing that for attention or they're manipulating the situation because I don't view it like that. I, I don't think that they have the language to say what their needs are. So I don't take it as they're seeking attention or they're manipulating. I think that they just don't know how to tell us. So what is your response to that? Yeah. First of all, like in terms of the attention seeking, it might be attention seeking, but I don't feel that attention seeking is a bad thing. There are times where, I'll think about it today. There are times where I will send my partner a text and he hasn't sent one back. And I just really want attention. I just want an emoji kiss back from him. That's what I want. So is that manipulating? No. Is that a bad thing? No. I think it's a very human thing that goes back to us wanting to belong, us wanting to feel significant to somebody. So I guess in my mind, I translate it differently to that that is one of a human need we all need. We all need. Um, yeah, so that's the first thing. The second thing about um, the manipulation or the, I think I said it, but I feel it's important to maybe say again that misbehavior bad behavior, rude child behavior is actually a solution that your child has found to a problem they have. And on some level, it's working for them. So it's not just, oh, this is bad behavior. This is like, this is, a, they've actually done their best with the tools they have, with the age and stage they're at to fix it. And this is how they fixed it. Does that make sense? I don't know how that part lands, Casey. That makes perfect sense. It, it's a perfect way to explain it. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. And then the next thing is, okay, so if they're wanting more belonging, how do they, how are they getting that met? Am I giving them the time that they need? Are they getting that from their other parent? Are that what is really going on here? Um. And sometimes it's asking them to say, hey, and, you know, hey, are you wanting my attention right now? Are you wanting special mom time right now? I know I've been really busy at work. I see it. I feel it too. So how about we sit down and plan some special time where we can just play together? You get to pick. That's very different than, you know, or a lot of times it happens when we're busy and we're on the phone. You know, one of my clients, Natasha, she, she's given me a testimonial on this, so I know she won't mind me sharing this, but we used to call it her mom control center, where the kitchen she had on their island, her papers, her computer, and she'd be making dinner and she'd be going back and forth to another email. She'd have her cell phone there, another text, and she was always multitasking. And one of the things we discovered was we needed to take mom control center out because she was actually not being very present with her kiddos. And so her kiddos had done an amazing job to find ways to keep mom busy, to keep her attention because they were desperate for it. And so we found, okay, we need to carve out and better 
carve out time where when she works, she works. And she and she actually found out she was much more efficient. That's why the third step on my the peaceful parent parenting path is um smart schedule. It's like we need to better manage our time. I find a lot of us because it's then we we can get resentful too. That's interesting. Like we talk about rude child behavior, but I want to talk about monster mom behavior. Because monster mom behavior can come up. And I I know when I start to go into mom, monster mom land, it is not pretty. But that's when I start to be like, ah, you know, that ah, and resentment. Casey, you had another question that I thought was really great. Do you want to share that? I can also read it out if you don't have it in front of you. No, I just asked um, whenever I give my children one task, if we're all eating dinner and I'll say, whenever you're done, you go take it to the kitchen. If one child gets up and does it, I want to say, Kelly, thank you for doing that. But I worry that whenever I get praised for them listening at first request, that my other children are hearing, you're bad, she's good. And that's not at all what I'm saying, but that might be what they're hearing. Yeah. And so then that might not be a sibling rivalry, but that's drawing sibling lines. And so I wanted to hear your take on it. This is a really great, great question. And it can be um, a delicate dance because... So I always start with you. So I would just say, really, when you're being completely honest with yourself, in that moment, are you using the noticing as just a noticing, an appreciation, or are you noticing it as a learning opportunity? Where you're like, I don't think I'm using it as manipulation or a tool. I'm honestly just grateful. Like, thank you for listening. Right. I'm very busy. Right. Yeah. So I really want to say, if you genuinely feel in your heart of hearts, it is pure gratitude, go for it. And I really mean that because I also don't want to hold back from the gratitude. I am a big one for gratitude. Um, Sunday nights at dinner, um, we always go around the table and say three things we're grateful for. And it's been really cool because I, in the last few years, I've had students from around the world become extended family. And I am amazed with teenagers, how much they're thanking me and saying one of the best things of our year with you, Kelly, I appreciate my family more, my parents more, my brother, my sister more, my boyfriend more, my teachers more. And I feel like if I have left them with anything, it's that. So if you have that, Casey, I want to keep that. So how it looks, especially if it's pure gratitude, it can be like, hey, thank you for, for doing that. It makes my job easier because it's also specific. So that to me isn't praise. Praise is like, oh, you're such an amazing helper. Right. And I'm not make, making eyes to the other two. Like, hey, she's great. No, I'm like, okay. Yeah. So, so the, so the gratitude and praise are maybe a difference. It's gratitude maybe. and praise are completely okay. different. And if it's specific, thank you for bringing your dish over quickly because it makes my job of getting them to dishwasher quicker. The more specific you can be and not labeling. Oh my gosh, you are the best chore kid around. Totally different. And that, if you hear it, there's a judgment in that. There is an absolute in that. Does that make sense? So gratitude, oh, it, it does. knock it your does. socks off. Yeah, gratitude, knock your socks off. Yeah. yeah. No, I think that you're right. I need to be adding to my gratitude why I'm, why. I love that. Specific, specific, specific. Not just a thank you. How, it's how it makes your life easier in the moment. It's fascinating, actually, with the two boys was really interesting. The oldest tended to be the academic, getting straight A's, et cetera. And it was interesting. One term, for whatever reason, he didn't connect with the teacher and his marks started to go down. The incredible thing was the other kids' marks started to go up. And I actually felt really sad because I was like, oh my gosh, they believe that only one can be the best at being the brainy one. And so what's cool though, is we started through gratitudes for one another and really supporting and really focusing on this team. We're a team and um, it started to shift. And the night it shifted, it actually brought tears to my eyes. It was probably, it was many, many months. It didn't shift immediately, but it was many months later. We were doing grateful force 
to be grateful for one another and what we were grateful for. And I knew I was like, oh, like, this is amazing. Hallelujah. Like I literally was when one said, I'm grateful for, and he said his brother's name, his A that he got today in school. And I was like, oh my gosh, because months later, like the previous was like, I'm grateful my brother didn't beat me up as he, as he often as he does. Like, you know, it would be like that. And it oh. takes time sometimes to shift the culture in the family. I know that I made up questions. I have to run to another meeting, but thank you for answering all of my questions today, Kelly. You are so welcome. I'm awesome. so glad you were here. I'm going to answer another question I got. Unless Stephanie has a question. And if you do, you can put it in the chat. Oh, there are things in the chat. Here she is. Hello. Hello. Uh, yeah, I had a quick question. When you mentioned that um, your two boys are very academic, my actually my three, they all play uh, lacrosse and they're very, my two, my, my daughter, obviously she's not quite nine, so she's just getting into it. But my two boys are very competitive. Um, and uh, so how do we mitigate that? Because uh, my oldest son, I keep, I've catch him when he's like well you know he's not as good as and I'm like he's two years younger than you you know just uh, but that correction I'm just trying to change his thoughts to, to be supportive like because it's not at the moment okay great question I'm so glad you brought this up Stephanie and so first of all I just want to give you kudos for being a aware of it like you're on it right so I'm like yay mom you're on it b the second thing is when those comparisons a very obvious comparisons are brought. I was like, mm, yeah, but you know, and it's that sense of, I'm going to put you in your place. You know what I'm talking about, right? So like lacrosse, oh, but their game wasn't that good or they didn't, or they can't do blah, blah, blah. Then I would say something like, hey, why do you think that's important to you? I'm just curious. And so I think, remember I was on one of the tips I gave was to ask more than you tell. The reason we can go into lecture mom mode where we get on our soapbox and we're like, hey, that's not fair. And believe you me, this is the one I watch the most probably in my own parenting. I actually like the sound of my voice. This is why maybe I'm good at doing what I do here. And so, and I also think it makes me feel like I'm teaching a lesson. Like I'm like, okay, I'm being the good mom, right? It's, it's my significance. I'm being the good mom. I'm giving the lesson. What I'm learning more and more and what I'm reminded with my clients, especially when I'm working with kids, is if I ask them more, it kind of sheds new light. Because, you know, we talked about that iceberg. It's like what I'm doing when I ask them a question. It's like I'm taking their hand and we're putting scuba diving material. We got our oxygen and we're going a little bit below the surface to say, hey, I'm curious. Does that seem like a really supportive comment? And I just wait. Because what it does is, I think one of our biggest, highest roles as parents is to help our kids become better critical thinkers. And this is that part of the frontal lobe that is not developed, is being developed, is developing. And one of the ways we can do it is by asking questions to get them to think about it. Because you know, when you say something, I don't know about you, Stephanie, but for me, it often goes one ear out the other and they're like, whatever, I'm busy. I am, you know, and, and they don't even really, it doesn't land. How does that sound to you? Does that, whoopsie. I don't, I, you're, you're muted. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I was playing, trying to get unmuted. (laughs) I I do enough virtual meetings, but uh, that sounds really good. And it's just curious because you had mentioned birth order. I am the oldest. And then my son, who is the critical one um, is also the oldest, but he is not, he doesn't have a lot of those other traits that come with the oldest child. He's quite needy, um, you know, that kind of mom, 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 it's not, and then not fair, you know, he between him and his sister you know they so um but this should be helpful this because you know I mean when I make him think and you know like yeah your brother did really well and I mean even they went and watched their sister last night 
well, so apparently they were really watching their devices, but they were there trying to be <laughs> they were helpful. Um, they were there. But, you know, um, they're both, they're great with her. Most of, like with that kind of stuff. Other times it's just a free for all, but, um, you know, but this will be really helpful. Why does it matter to you? I mean, it's not your game. It's not your like this shouldn't matter to you at all, really. It's great. Stephanie, yeah. just a couple of nuances, and I hope I want. I hope you'll let me know how it goes. Like, DM mm -hmm. me because I I would like to know how it goes, and because there might be some massaging of it right. to yep. take it to the next level. Because there's always, but two things you said is they were really supportive of their sister. So I find that a lot. Is sometimes remember I talked about birth order and gender. Mm -hmm. differences. Mm -hmm. So sometimes just the fact that she's the sister it's easier to be supportive of her. Sometimes that can be a thing. The other thing, when you mentioned the oldest, I think this is an, a potentially important part for other people to hear and why he might not have the traits. So in birth order, this is just the bell curve, the average, mm, okay, what yeah. happens, right? When a child doesn't exhibit the normal state, usually one of two things have happened. One, somebody else has done it better in the family. Okay. So, and so I don't know how much younger is the next one. Uh, just over two years. They're is all about two years apart. Yeah. Okay. Two years apart. And is that the sister? Nope. The sister is the youngest and she does not like her when her brothers are over supportive. Just yeah. interesting. Okay. So that's really cool. So is your second one, does he exhibit some of the ones that the older one might not? No, but he does have extra challenges. And so we have, yeah. So when this happens, when you have a special needs child or someone who's been sick as well, mm -hmm. like yeah. has illness, um, that can be a huge, um, it shifts the dynamics of the birth okay. order yep. extremely. So that's one of them that makes a big, big difference. Um, yeah, that uh, maybe I'll talk, maybe I'll do a whole masterclass just on birth order because it's a fast. Yeah, no, this is, a, yeah, this is. Yep. Thank you. You are so welcome. I'm so glad you were here, Stephanie. And again, let me know how that goes. I'll be curious to know.